Okay, I think um, uh, I've already said this that when, when you're think doing things like uh, measuring, um, uh, you know, um, attitudes and, and motives and things of this kind, you you have scales. Well, there are various ways of doing this, and checklists and ratings is is the first way of doing things. Um, so here's an example. I, I, I again I took this off the, the web. Um, an example of a questionnaire. Again, not not wonderfully designed one, but I just took this one question about rating movies. I think the movies are about three or four years old, actually. I remember seeing some of these about three or four years ago, or perhaps even longer. Uh, so it's not very up to date. But here's just simply people's opinions about films. And they're asked to rate the one, Milk, The Reader, Curious Case of Benjamin Button, and so on, as either disliked a lot or liked a lot. Um, and you can see there's a one to five scale. I think, I mean, we're that familiar with these things now, it's pretty obvious how to fill it in. If you really think people aren't, don't understand how to fill it in, then what you can do is provide an example beforehand. So it might say, if you think this film was, you know, you liked it a lot, uh, then circle the five and actually show that happening um, in, just before the question itself. But I think most people are familiar how to do this now. And of course, you circle X if you didn't see it. And then as a subsidiary question, if you had one vote, like the Academy Award, uh, which is the one you'd vote for? So what's the most important one in some sense, or, or the best one for you? So there's a, there's a simple way of rating things, um, which is often um, a, a common feature of questionnaires. One or two other possibilities. Um, this is where an example is very helpful on, on the questionnaire, because this is an unusual way of doing it. So you often have to give an example on the questionnaire of how to fill it in. But how would you rate your mother? <laughs> I see a few nods over here. <laughs> Are they appropriate or inappropriate? I made this one up, I have to say. But um, um, is your mother warm-hearted or cold-hearted, patient or impatient, etc.? And the instructions to respondents would be to, to put a tick across the line where they think their mother comes on that range. And you'd say something like, if you think your mother is very warm-hearted, then you put a tick you know, here on, the, on, on, the, on, on that scale. If you think your mother is a little bit cold-hearted, then you put a, a tick over there, a line across on that. Now, actually, once people have got the idea of how to do this, it's very easy for them to do it. It's much easier to do them than scoring numbers, because they can put it exactly where they want it. And you know, they, they feel somehow that, that variability is, is, is good as a way of judging things. The downside is it's very hard for you, the researcher, to deal with, because you have to go through and measure them. You have to kind of put a ruler underneath and measure exactly where they are to get, get the, the nearest percentage point on, on the scale. So it takes a lot of time afterwards to, 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 uh, to code the answers. But there, you know, I've just given you a couple of examples. Bear in mind, there are lots of different ways of doing these scales and checklists and ratings and so on. So, so here's a, a couple of examples. That previous one, the numbers that you see very often, is a different way using a, 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 a ticks across a, a range in some sense. Notice also this one here. I suppose it goes from like a lot to, not to dislike. That, uh, that the scale has some kind of meaning. Here, each scale is different. Um, so it's warm-hearted, cold-hearted is the first line. The, the second line is a different scale, patient and impatient. And you indicate that by the words. So sometimes the scales are all the same, liking a lot, disliking a lot, and sometimes they are different scales. It's up to you how you design the questionnaires. So scaling. Um, ideally, if you're going to be using scales, thinking of some way of combining together issues and questions to produce a single number that in some way represents people's views, their attitude towards something, uh, their motivation, whatever, um, then you need to have these criteria uh, satisfied. Um, and just to give an example of this, I had a student many years ago now who designed a scale, she actually used a Likert scale, designed the scale to measure greenness. Um, this was how ecological is, was something, how, how environmentally aware, how green were they? That, that was the issue she wanted to know. And she started with something of the order of a hundred different questions she could ask um, in, in the pool to begin with, before narrowing that down to something like 20 questions actually on the final scale that she used, 20 issues that people scored and then they can be combined together. But she also found interestingly that, that what she was doing to begin with wasn't unidimensional. Um, what was actually going on was that there were two or three different things that people were talking about when they talked about greenness or about environmental issues and so on. Um, 
and one of them had to do with um, you know the, the general issue about you know saving the world and whatever you know protecting the environment. Another one had to do with much more to do with uh, with issues of um, of um, I suppose conservatism, that kind of you know, with a small c of, of not changing things and so on. Um, and we managed through various kinds of statistics to, 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 to isolate those kinds of, of different dimensions. So that's one problem you have with scaling, is that very often when you start, begin with, you might find that actually there are two or three different things going on that all combine together into the area you're looking at. And really what you want to have is just simply one dimension, one of those things. So it's got to be unidimensional. So when people are on that end of it, they're all on that end of it. When they're on that end of it, they're all on that end of it. And, and we can see clearly how, how that, that scale varies across that one single dimension. I mean, I mean to, to give you another example of what that means, it's like trying to say somebody's a big person. A big, big can mean tall. It can mean large, you know, heavy. Um, it can be mean, it can mean loud even, I suppose, people with big personality and so on. So big can be, is, is multidimensional. And we've got to narrow that down to just measure one of those things. We want to know, are they tall or not? Are they heavy or not? Are they loud or not? And so on. Um, and, and, and that's simply it. It helps to be linear so that as you go along the scale, each increment measures a, a proper increase rather than all being bunched up in, at one end, a non-linear scale. That, that's... That's not always obvious, but, but sometimes it's clear that the scale is not linear, particularly when you find everyone's bunching down one end. So you've got to somehow you know, readjust the scale so that don't all bunch down one end because it's not linear. It's got to be reliable, and of course anything you do has got to be reliable, it's got to be consistent. Next time you do it, you've got to get the same answers, um, similar answers and so on from people. So again, you do it you know, time and again to see if you get reliable answers from it on, on similar groups of people. And it's got to be valid, and that's probably the most important thing of all, the, the one that, that's, not, um, that, that's hardest to prove, is that it really is measuring what you think it's measuring. So back to my student measuring greenness. Did her questions really capture greenness? And that's where you come into two things, I guess. There, One was starting with a large number of questions to begin with that she narrowed down and threw lots away. Um, you know, you just go all over the place and everything you can think of so that you, you, know, you cover all the ground you possibly can to try to capture that idea of what being green means. Um, and the second thing is to, um, to use what, what we call the ecological validity. Does it make sense? Does it, does it seem to you as a person to capture what's meant by that term? Um, and, and would others see it the same way? Um, so th there's those kind of two senses of making sure it is a, is a valid measure of the thing you think you're measuring. Okay, that's one or two examples. Oops. Um, here's the major types. I'm not going to go in into detail with these, but as I say, uh, Oppentheim talks about these. Um, third tone scales, um, different ways of creating scales. Uh, in the case of the third stone, you start with a set of judges who rank things. Um, and you, you, you go through a whole process. I mean, most of these scales take a lot of time to do. You have a whole big process before you actually uh, produce the questionnaire. And in this case, judges are ranking items, and then you bring those, those judgments together into a single ranking of items. And then the, the, the scale works by people ticking some way down the scale to the item they, they want that, that agrees with them. A Likert scale, um, which you're most familiar with, I'm sure that's where you have you know, strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, um, strongly disagree, and so on, and you, you tick it for each statement, and the combination of the statements is added up to give you an overall score. Um, and of course, the, the hard work comes in getting those statements. That's back to my student with her husband's so 100 statements. Um, uh, that, that was a difficulty, get, going through all that process of getting, narrowing it down to just the 20 she actually used. Gutman scalagram, um, items eliminated to form a rank scale. Again, um, there's a long process beforehand of creating the scale, but it is in some ways similar to the first stone. You have a scale of items, and um, people, whichever one they finally agree with, uh, uh, the one that they tick is where they are on that, on that scale, um, and that's, that's one way of measuring them. And again, you have to create that scale beforehand. And the last one I've given you is pair comparisons, which I've actually used myself um, some years ago now. Um, this is where you have 
sets of items and you're asking people to compare one against the other. A bit like Viv was doing in, in the um, person construct um, session she did with the, the, grid, the, the grids. <coughs> but in this case, just using pairs. Um, people are asked, you know, do you prefer that or that? Is that better or that better? Or whatever the question is. And they have to answer one or the other. But items appear in many different pairs. So that item, it might be, you know, to, to use Viv's examples, it might be chocolates. Do you prefer this one or that one? Um, and you choose the one you prefer, but then that chocolate appears with other pairs of chocolates as well. And with a bit of mathematics behind the, the scenes, you can then readjust their, their pairwise choice to, re to, to, to identify which is the most popular, least popular, and so on. So in this case, the, the, the work is not so much beforehand, the work is afterwards. Once you get the results back of your questionnaire, you've got to then recalculate as to what people were actually were scoring with the different items. Uh, pair comparison is very useful, by the way, when people have difficulty making decisions. When, and, and, and chocolate is a good idea there, because it's often difficult. Well, I like both. You know, which one, you know, and actually a pairwise comparison is easier to do in that sense very often than it is to, 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 uh, to choose from a list. Here's some examples. Uh, here's a Likert scale. Um, this is a, the global warming one, I think. Um, and you can see you've got a number of columns. In this case, I've got, um, what have I got? One, two, three, six, haven't I? Six columns. Um, and there'll be a range. In this case, it's from strongly agree to, oh, I suppose it's five, including the not applicable. Um, it's five real columns. How many columns you have can be an issue. And there is a, a, lots of debate in the literature about whether you should have odd or even number of columns because an, an even number omits the neutral one in the middle. And you might want to force people to choose one or the other. That's fine, but you need to make sure you, you know you're doing it. Do you have three, five, or seven? Um, again, there's debates about that. The more you have, the more variability you give people. That's somewhat easier to do, but maybe the less meaningful it is. Um, depends, again, what, what you're doing and what works. This is another reason why piloting is a good idea, because if you want to know which works best, then pilot your designs. Down the left-hand side are statements. Uh, and where these come from is, is of course, the, the, the work you have to do beforehand. Back to my student, she started with 100 and narrowed it down to about 20. You have to have good statements that differentiate people. And there's a whole set of, uh, of, of issues behind this, which I can't, I can't really go into now. But it's not just making up a few statements and putting them down. It's a lot of work to make sure they're the ones that do the job properly. They've got to differentiate people. They've got to be uniscalar. Um, they've got to be valid and reliable and so on and so forth. So it's not obvious. Um, but you can see the kind of ideas. Short, quick statements that people can either agree or disagree with. That's, that's the idea of liquor. Do you think that's why it's important to have neutral as an option? Because that might actually show that people may be quite apathetic about something. They might not have an opinion about carbon emissions. And if you had yeah. a lot of people <coughs> saying neutral, that might show something in itself, might it? Yes, it might. And, and if, that, if that was your research interest, mm -hmm. then you would include neutral for that very reason. But on the other hand, you might want to say, I want to force it. I'm actually concerned with how many, I want to know how many people don't, don't care a toss about this. So actually, I'm not, I'm, the neutral is too easy for them. That gives them an opt out. I don't want that. I want to force the issue. I want to force them to. So it's again, like a dividing line, isn't it? On the focus. So, you know, it's your research interest that's going to drive the things in that sense. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> But you can see that, so that's a fairly typical layout um, of how you do it. You can do it in other ways, uh, using other technologies. I think I've got some other examples here. Yep, here's a couple I've, I've um, taken from the internet. Um, here it's done by a, a line of numbers um, with the extremes at either end. This gets around having to give names to the in-between ones, like neutral and things like that, and, and slightly disagree or slightly agree and so on. Don't have to worry about that, just got the extremes mentioned. There's still a not agree one on the right hand side, so uh, sorry, not applicable rather on the right hand side. Um, and this one's got seven points on it as well, rather than five. Um, so you can, there's another way of laying it out, and you just circle the number you want. Um, here's one that's done from the internet. In this case, you've got um, radio buttons. So you just simply click on the radio button that applies to you, and that's what's recorded. Um, and of course, you have to have the names of the, the items. So you've got always, usually, sometimes, rare, never. Uh, against these. I think that's useful having the comments on the right hand side because um, 
thing. We do a questionnaire with some people who are very frustrated when there isn't a space mm -hmm. to give their card. Yeah, I think that's a really, particularly that's a useful thing to do when you're doing a pilot as well, because then you get feedback, and that's when you realise that perhaps the statements don't mean anything to some people, in which case you've, you've got to perhaps omit them altogether and things of that kind. Um, I think we have to be careful with free text um, sometimes. Careful with free text? Because um, I think you have to be clear about whether you, you want to include that in your, in your results, because quite often it's not meaningful. Well, it depends what you're doing. If, if, you, if you're designing an open-ended question, yeah. you want that text oh, yeah. there. The, the difficulty is interpreting it, perhaps. It may not be clear what the person meant by their comment. And you have to. And the point is, with much free text, what you end up doing is classifying it or categorising it. So you, you read through all the answers you've got, and you say, actually, that falls into five groupings. And that white person falls into that group, that person into that group. That person might fall into two groups. You know, they might have a long answer that, that, that addresses two issues and so on. And so, effectively, you're coding. You're saying, that's a one, that's a two, that's a one and a two, that's a three, and so on, as you go through. That takes a lot of time, but that's how you transform it. Sometimes you might want to keep the comments as comments to add in to your write-up later on as well, though. You might want to say, you know, uh, people answered in general this kind of way, but here's some examples of the answers they gave, um, particularly if they're given longer answers. When I've done this recently, I, I did a survey of, of um, teachers of qualitative analysis, would you believe? <laughs> people who teach qualitative analysis. And of course, because they're qualitative people, they wrote lots. I gave them the opportunity to do that as well. And often little essays were coming up. And it's actually quite interesting points as well. Um, I anonymised it. Of course, it's online anyway, so it is anonymous. Uh, although, actually, I did ask for emails at the end if people wanted a, a copy of the report. Um, but so, uh, you know, you can do that as well and include quotations. But I think the, from experience, the most difficult thing is to work out what they meant by their comment. Sometimes it's obvious, but sometimes it's not. Uh, but yeah, so having things like that, certainly on the pilot, is, is, is very useful.